Thank you to our almost inaugural presentation for our science talk series. So thank you very much for coming under the weather. Stellar outside and you want to be outside, but thank you for coming here. So, and, and today's talk is particularly ap apropos because just a week ago, a report came out called the Living Planet Report from the World Wildlife Fund. It had some alarming news. It said that on average, vertebrate species, vertebrates are fishes, sharks, amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals, on average, 60% of those populations have decreased in numbers over the last 45 years. Also, the same report said 50% of all coral organisms, not just species, but organisms, 50% of the coral organisms on the planet have disappeared in the last 25 years. And that 20% of the Amazonian rainforest has disappeared in the last 50 years. Do the math. How many of you plan on being alive in 45 years? Most of you. Extrapolate at the current rate of loss of species, will you have any vertebrates left? No, but of course it's not the current rate, it's accelerating. Will you have any corals left? No. Will you have any rainforest left? No, unless we do something about it. And that's why we're here today having the conversation. How did we get here? Who wasn't minding the store? How did this happen? Doesn't anybody care? And hopefully, what can we do about it, right? How do you get to that point where we can, can change that? So we see that these organisms are here for future generations. So the game plan today is take a look at how do we define populations? You've heard the terms endangered, threatened, vulnerable, extinct. What do they mean? Do they have a, a, a meaning? Yeah, they do. And it's important to the context of our conversation today. Then we'll take a look at what's happening in the world, in the US, and in Michigan as far as endangered, threatened, and vulnerable species. Now, a lot of what we'll be talking about today are animals. Why? They have a higher cuddle factor. It's hard to get you excited about the loss of liverworts or mosses or ferns. But when I say panda, when I say elephant, you get all warm and fuzzy inside, don't you? Okay. So we'll look at a lot of animal examples. But understand, you don't get elephants if you don't have forest. You don't get whales if you don't have plankton. So keep that in context. What we're talking about today refers to all life forms on the planet. Then we'll take a look at reasons for population decline. Why is this happening? The numbers that I started with, how is this even possible? So let's take a look here then at our first part here on population classifications. Species of concern, this is a population classification we just use here in Michigan. A species of concern is any species or any population that's in apparent decline, but we don't have enough data yet to say for sure. But it appears that these species are decreasing. Look at some examples from Michigan here. A moose. You go, well, we have moose in Michigan. Yes, but we used to have moose everywhere in Michigan. And now we have them just in some regions of the UP, basically Newberry, okay, in the UP. Osprey, we see in the center. Um, bald eagle, the wood turtle. The Mossasauga rattlesnake. Many of you didn't even know we had rattlesnakes in Michigan. The good news is it's a sissy on the scale of rattlesnakes. This one you'd have to get angry, throw it down your pants to get it to bite you. And so it's nothing you should worry about, but it's an indication. It's a canary in the coal mine that things aren't going well. And box turtles. Many of you who grew up in Michigan recognize you used to see box turtles everywhere on the road. When's the last time you saw a box turtle? So these are species of concern. It looks like the writing's in the wall, but we need more data to say for sure. How about threatened species? This is not only in Michigan, but a US classification for the US Federal Endangered Species list. These are species that are in decline, where natality, natality is birth rate. So where the natality is actually near the mortality rate. So basically, the death and birth rates are pretty much equal in a precarious balance at that point. And it said that these species could rapidly become endangered. Is there some change in the limiting factors of the environment? change in food, change in climate, change in habitat, any type of pressure could rapidly push them to the next category. And we're going from better to worse as we go through these sequences right here. Take a look here, a polar bear is a great example. Polar bears should probably be on the endangered species list, but there are a lot of politics involved as where you wind up on the list. So polar bears should probably be endangered at this point. We take a look here at otters. Otters are also considered to be a threatened species. Humpback whales, grizzly bears, on the bottom right-hand side, we have the manatee, should also probably be an endangered species, but there's some politics involved in the classification. The spotted owl, 
And the bison, this is the woods bison. We used to have two species in the, in the United States. We still have two species, but the woods bison isn't doing very well. We'll talk about some of these as we go through the presentation. Then we get endangered. Mm, not the route you want to go. You want to go the opposite direction on this list. Endangered species where their mortality exceeds their natality. So death rate exceeds the birth rate. Some of the poster species you may know, and this guy right here, which of course is the what? Anybody know? It's a jaguar. You go, jaguars don't occur in North America. They used to occur in Arizona. They used to occur in New Mexico. They used to occur in Southeast California. We don't even know if they occur in the United States anymore. There's some records we think they might be there. And then of course, the wolf. The wolf is an endangered species. Interesting point. Biologically, not an endangered species. Put back on the endangered species list because of the behavior of one state government. Guess which state that was? Michigan. Your, environment, your DEQ actually voted to have it a huntable species in Michigan three years ago. So the Fed said, if you can't play nicely and guard your natural resources, we will. It was put back on the endangered species list to take it out of control of the state of Michigan. <laughs> and then, of course, sea turtles. All species of sea turtles are endangered. This guy right here, the black-footed ferret, it's a ferret. You know what ferrets are. These are critically endangered in the wall for reasons we'll be talking about. This guy called the Everglades kite. This guy called the key deer. And our own Michigan endangered species, this one right here, is actually called the Kirtland's warbler, possibly the most endangered bird species in the world right here in Michigan. We'll take a look at how they're doing. And you can tell, not well. Then we're going to take a look at rare species. Rare species won't be the point of our talk today because rare species are naturally low in numbers because of some unique aspect of their habitat. Their habitat itself is very rare, and therefore, so are they. This guy, whoa, let's go backwards here. Um, over here on this guy right over here, this is called a cassowary. Appears in one tiny little strip of rainforest on the eastern seaboard of Australia. That's it. That's the only place it's ever occurred because of its habitat that it occupies is very rare. That's the case here with this guy, a rock wallaby of Australia. Some species live in a patch of rocks the size of this building and nowhere else. They've evolved on that rock patch. This thing right here, it's a tree kangaroo. That's a thing. Tree kangaroos. These are kangaroos that live in trees. Who came up with that one? Dr. Zeus? Okay. They live in a very small area of northern Queensland, Australia. And then many species of orchids are found in one patch of forest and nowhere else. This animal right here, which is called the black leopard, found in one mountain in one country in Australia, found in Kenya. Very unique habitat. It's not a separate species, but it's a subspecies found in that, only that area. The okapi, critically endangered in northern Africa, okay, but also naturally rare. If you're naturally rare, then you have hunting pressures, et cetera. We have a bit of a disaster set up for us there. Take a look here, extinct. We're going to look at a couple different classifications here of extinct. The first one is commercially extinct. This means although your population numbers may be doing OK, your birth rate, your natality still may be greater than your mortality rate, you're not commercially viable to harvest anymore because your population numbers have plummeted. Example, whales. Most whale species right now are, are um, <coughs> commercially extinct. Probably what's going to save whale species on our planet is rust. It's not legislation. It's the fact that once today's whale fleet rusts out of existence, nobody is building new whaling ships because there's no money in whaling anymore. And so it's rust that's going to save the whales. It just isn't worth doing it anymore. There's some cultural harvests of it, but nothing commercially. Same thing with the sea otter. The sea otter, we now own Alaska. And we now occupy California because the Russians decided it wasn't economically viable to harvest sea otters and seals anymore. So they sold us Alaska, and they got out of California. If you go up to San Francisco Bay, the Russian River, it's called that for a reason, you'll still see Russian barns. The Russians occupied California, Oregon, and Washington for a very long time, harvesting seals and otters. They were no longer economically viable. They were commercially extinct. Our own whitefish here from the Great Lakes, look at the harvesting we used to do here. We used to harvest boatloads of these on a daily basis. Whitefish are now commercially extinct from the Great Lakes. It used to be our most abundant fish in the Great Lakes. And so commercially extinct is one kind of extinction. How about regionally extinct? This means that, and the name implies, they're extinct from a given region. They may occur in abundance somewhere else, but they're no longer in that area. Take a look at this guy right here. This is the California condor. 
largest flying bird in North America. It used to occur all the way from Northern California down to the tip of Baja, California. Now about 50 of them remaining in a tiny area in Ventura, California. This guy right here, the moose, regionally extinct from the lower peninsula of Michigan. It used to occur in the Grand Rapids area at one point. The bison, do you know we used to have bison in Kalamazoo? The prairie came all the way up to Kalamazoo River and South. We even had the greater a prairie chicken there, or the sage grouse if you prefer. They occurred in Kalamazoo. They're regionally extinct from the Midwest at this point. And of course, pandas. Poor guys, we're going to see pandas come up many times today because pandas are getting it from all sides. They're regionally extinct from over 95% of their range. We can also be extinct in the wild, something you don't want to be. This guy over here is called a curacao from South America, not known in the wild anymore, only remaining in zoos, as is the case with the Chinese tiger, as is the case with the Hawaiian crow. Hawaiian crows, tool using bird, extinct in the wild, only found in breeding programs. And this animal right here, which is the Somalian oryx, also only found in zoos. They're extinct in the wild at this point. How about extinct biologically? This is where you don't want to be. And again, we've been going from best, if you can say that, to worst here. Biologically extinct means you haven't been seen anywhere on the planet in 50 years, five zero years. For instance, this animal over here, we'll come back and revisit. This guy over here is the marsupial dog, the thylacine wolf from Tasmania. Imagine your German separate having puppies going into a pouch, no longer with us since about 1920. This guy down here, the dodo bird, biologically extinct. The elephant bird, biologically extinct, 1,100 pounds. This guy, no longer with us either. Velociraptor, some of you might say, that's a good thing. I think it'd be kind of cool at the John Ball Zool. But of course, a lot of the dinosaurs are biologically extinct. And this animal right here, the stellar sea cow, biologically extinct just 27 years after its discovery. So these are no longer with us. They're not coming back. So this is kind of a review. We've talked about species of special concern. We need more research. We've talked about threatened, natality rate, barely more than mortality rate, endangered, mortality rate exceeding uh, natality rate, rare, just naturally low in numbers because of the rare habitats they occupy, and then extinct. So clearly you don't want to be anywhere on this list, certainly towards the bottom. So what's the situation here across the planet? There's an organization that has as its role to monitor the population status of plants and animals on the planet. It's called the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN. Originally funded by the United Nations, now independently funded. They've been together since the mid-60s, and every year they come out with something called the Red Data Book, which now, of course, is online. And it's depressing. Every year it comes out because more and more species get added. According to the most recent version that came out, they list more than 26,000 species that are threatened with extinction, right? The worst classification you could be in there and still be on there. That's more than 27% of all the assessed species on the planet. 41 species of amphibians are endangered, threatened with extinction. 25% of mammals, 34% of conifers, pine trees, et cetera. Birds, 13%, sharks and rays, I'm sorry, yeah, birds, 13%, sharks and rays, 31. And then reef corals, one third of them. You say, is this acceptable? And the answer clearly it has to be no. So it's not looking good on the world base. Let's take a look in the United States. 13,000 species federally classified organisms that are endangered or threatened. Here it is on a breakdown by breakdown county. And you see Kent County? We have ours. You can take a look. I enlarged the key for you over here. So we have blue two to four listed species in Kent County. But remember, that's just federally listed. Where do you see the numbers I give you for Michigan? Michigan, we have 26 federally listed endangered and threatened species. We have 400 100 species, Michigan listed, of threatened and species of concern. So on the state listings, we have 400 species. So it's not looking good right now, OK? Take a look at this. This is a report that just came out from the DEQ here, the DNR, DEQ in Michigan, that shows the total count here of species in Michigan that are right here, species of greatest conservation need, 28 species of mussels. You say, I don't care about mussels. Don't have a pet mussel? Never knew one, OK? It's important because they're towards the bottom of the food chain. And what happens at the bottom of the food chain has an influence, of course, upon the top of the food chain. So yeah, we should care. But you can see the difference between 2005 and 2015. 
We went from 28 species to 38, from 36 to 61, while some others went down. You say, well, that's good news. If you read Appendix B of this report, it tells you why they went down. And a lot of it is basically lack of any information that was gathered between the time period of the first report and the second report. Therefore, they were summarily just removed. It's not because things got better. It's because just nobody did any additional work on them. OK, so part three, how did we get here? And I could spend an hour on every one of these, but Tim said I don't have 18 hours, OK? But any one of these could be a whole seminar in itself. This is the Reader's Digest Cliff Notes condensed version of these topics. And you're welcome to explore or contact me and find out more about this. But this, again, is a very, very expansive topic. So let's figure out why plants and animals are decreasing in abundance. One of which could be here, intentional eradication. You, come on, nobody would actually go out and intentionally eradicate an organism from the planet. No organism on this planet has ever competed with humans and won, period. There's no footnote there. Right? What species has ever competed with humans and been successful? None. Take a look at this right here. Who are these guys? Prairie dogs. Cattle ranchers don't like prairie dogs. Both species are endangered at this point because they've been eradicated, including a state-run bounty in three of the states they occur in. The wolf. Also, still, believe it or not, Alaska still has a bounty on wolves. And other states are considered critically endangered. Alaska has a special variance on, on the law. So we have been eradicating them for well over a century, and we've done a really good job of that. We take a look over here, tigers. Tigers prey upon humans. We don't like that, so we've been, a we've been getting rid of tigers intentionally because we don't want tigers around if you live in tiger territory. Uh, this bird right here, Carolina parakeet. This is North America's only native parrot. They used to occur in flocks of hundreds of thousands, and they would land at night in fruit trees of orchards where they would feed upon the fruit. There was an intentional eradication program to get rid of them by putting diesel on them at night and then lighting, you know, lighting the, the orchards and whatnot to get rid of them. They're now biologically extinct. The last one died a long time ago. Down here, fruit bats. They're pretty cute. They're called flying foxes. They're the size of a fox, and they're frugivores. They feed upon fruit, but they scare people, and they poop a lot. And people don't like them around for fear that they produce rabies, which they don't. They don't carry rabies. I lived in Australia for several years, and they would actually go on and eradicate whole mangrove areas, which you see up here, because their fruit bats nest in them. With respect to mangrove forest, in the Caribbean, you don't want to have a mangrove forest in front of your five-star hotel, because you can't swim in the beach if there are mangroves growing there. So mangroves have been systematically removed from almost all the Caribbean islands to make it safe for five-star hotels. And then what happens when the hurricane comes through to the beaches? Right? The beaches get wiped out. So now they're trying to reestablish them in those areas. And then, of course, mountain lions. We've done a really good job of intentionally eradicating mountain lions because they prey upon our livestock. So there's a very long history of intentional eradication of plant and animal species that has been, unfortunately, far too successful, okay? Including this guy right here, one from Australia I mentioned before. This is the thylacine, the marsupial dog. Last one seen, last one died in the Hobart Zoo in 1921, and uh, this was the last one shot in the wild right here, and he's very proud. Last one shot in the wild. It turns out they have a massive jaw that wraps beautifully around the neck of a sheep. And so the sheep farmers in Australia had a bounty, and they're now biologically extinct from the planet because of intentional eradication. Introduction of disease. Now, we're not intentionally, hopefully, introducing disease into the wild, but it happens. You can have perfectly healthy populations where diseases enter that may not be a natural disease for that population. This little guy over here, not terribly cute on a 1 to 10 scale, a good-looking animal, probably about a 2 or 3 but they're called African hunting dogs. It's a native species. They're actually not a domestic dog. It's a wild species almost completely eradicated from Kenya because of the inadvertent introduction of rabies in the domestic dog population. Over 95% of the population disappeared across Kenya, and now we're desperately trying to reintroduce them. Nobody did that intentionally, but sometimes species take the toll. We look over here, Michigan. This is, this is actually bovine tuberculosis, which has now jumped species barriers from bovines, cattle, 
into our white-tailed deer population, even with one account of transmission into a hunter through a weird mechanism. And so now we're seeing our white-tailed deer population that's being affected. How about this? Chronic wasting disease? Also, a weird type of disease related to mad cow disease, if you know about prions and whatnot. Again, not a native you know, disease to the population, introduced inadvertently. And then how about here? Dutch elm disease, right? When's the last time you saw a wild elm? Anywhere in North America. They don't occur anymore. So we're desperately trying to reintroduce them with a hybrid to survive the fungus. So sometimes we lose entire species because of introduction to disease that was not even done intentionally. Okay, pet in the zoo trade. You go, oh, don't tell me. The pet in the zoo trade has a huge impact upon wildlife species worldwide. When you get a turtle for 20 bucks at the pet store, uh, most of these turtles you see of this size are a good 35 years, 50 years old. Who's going to raise a turtle for 25 to 30 years in captivity, sell it to the pet store for 10 bucks so they can sell it to you for 20? They all come where? Out of the wild. They come out of the wild. I remember when I first moved to Michigan, I saw one of the, the uh, nursery supplies down on 28th Street. They were selling red earth sliders. And I called the DNR and said, they're selling red earth sliders. They go, well, those aren't red earth sliders from Michigan. That's against the law. They're from Indiana. You can bring Indiana turtles in and sell them in Michigan. So we care about our turtles. We just don't care about the Indiana turtles, apparently. Okay? And then orangs. The orang population has been plummeted because of the zoo trade. Ain't no zoo is a zoo unless they have an orang. And so there's a huge black market still today on taking orangs out of the wild in order to have zoos, in order to have these for exhibition. Komodo dragons, same thing, zoo trade. John Ball Zoo had our own Komodo to about four or five years ago, died of old age. Zoos would love to have these. There's a huge black market trade on taking these endangered animals from the wild and getting them to zoos. This little guy right here, I grew up, called the horned toad or the horned lizard from California. Extinct in many, regionally extinct from most of California because of the pet trade exclusively. And the list goes on. Here in California, black rat snakes, some of you may remember growing up where these things were everywhere. Some of you may think, I'm glad they're gone. No, it's really important to have them. The pet trade sold around the world. And toucans and blue and gold macaws, regionally extinct from most of Amazonia at this point because of the pet trade. So think when you buy an organism, has this come from a captive bred population say, I'm only getting one turtle. That's what 400,000 people said last year. I'm only buying one turtle. Okay. Horticultural trade, you go, oh, tell me it isn't true. We have a problem with plants. Yeah, we have a problem with plants. Plant rustling is a thing, okay? In the southwest deserts, there are cattle rustlers. This cactus right here, the saguaro cactus, or roadrunner fame, a cactus of that size, if it could even still be moved, you know, clandestinely, will sell on the cactus black market for about thirty to $50,000. And so they're actually cactus rangers in the federal lands out west, and they actually go around at night with the lights off, kind of like Border Patrol, but this is Cactus Patrol, to try and prevent people from rustling cactus. Because that plant right there could be four or five centuries old, and they're disappearing like crazy, okay? And the same thing with barrel cactus. The barrel cactus this size is a good seven, $800 cactus. Although you can raise them in captivity, it's cheaper to pull them out of the wild. Southwest deserts and Mexican deserts are being plundered for succulents like crazy. And there's very little jail time. It's a misdemeanor, if an offense at all, in most places. And then this over here, this is the Cooktown orchid, now extinct in the wild, only found in captivity because of its limited range in northeastern Queensland, one of the most coveted orchids because of its scarcity. They're better looking orchids, but you've got to have one if you're an orchid collector because they're rare. Because the more rare something is, the more we want to have it. This plant right here, this is called a Boeotia plant. It comes from Namibia, southwest Africa. There are so few left on the planet. Every single one, which is in this national park in Namibia, has a GPS tag on it. Every one is GPS tagged. There are rangers who are out there trying to guard these things because any botanical garden in the world would love to have one. It's like the local zoo getting a T-Rex. Okay, wouldn't you give anything? These are critically endangered ancient plants. The same thing with cycads being rustled from Australia. Australia, it's a felony, equivalent to drug traffic in, an Af in Australia, to take one of these out of Australia. But they're still disappearing because of the horticultural trade. So ask, where did your plants come from? Where does this cactus come from? And then how do I know? Okay. 
How about introduction of exotics, invasive species? Does this cause a problem? <laughs> oh, yeah. What happens when a non-native species, be it plant or animal, gets into a new ecosystem where there aren't any natural limiting factors? We can have chaos at that point. Take a look at this vermin right here. Okay, this guy's a starling. We're going to talk about him in just a second. We're going to talk about purple loosestrife. Let's talk about this guy. How cute is that fish? A lionfish, right? They're found in the aquarium trade. People love these until they recognize they're hard to care for and they're poisonous. So they take them down and say, oh, we should release them into the wild. They've been released into the Caribbean. They come from the South Pacific. They're like rats in the Caribbean. They're voracious predators, and guess what eats them? nothing in the Caribbean because nothing evolved, co-evolved with them to withstand their venom. So they go unconsumed in the Caribbean and they eat everything smaller than their face. So now, appropriately, there are actually bounties on these in the Caribbean. They're actually a bounty to get rid of them because they're just destroying the Caribbean ecosystem. And then, of course, pigs. Oh, my God. Mariners back in the 16th and 1700s introduced pigs onto islands across the planet. They're in Michigan. They're everywhere. And they're very aggressive predators. What doesn't a pig eat? There you go. Anything. They consume everything. They compete with every aspect of the food chain. How about out here? Look at that face. You got to love that thing, right? How cute is that? All right? That's a donkey or a burro. Look at that. On a cuddle factor of 1 to 10, that's a 15. God. And we have wild burros, don't we? You know how they got there? From the California miners that released them. Wild horses, you know how they got there? From the Californian Western expansion who lost the horses. They're not a native component of North America, contrary to what you see in Westerns, where Native Americans come riding across the hills on horses. Wasn't a thing. So in 1972, we passed the Wild Horses and Burrow Act that protects these. Bad move, because it turns out they're devastating for the environment. What feeds upon wild horses? Nothing. What feeds upon wild burrows? Nothing. They're called feral, by the way. Anything that's domestic that's returned in the wild is called feral. And so it's against the law to shoot these, to remove these. Why do we care? Turns out that burrows are really aggressive. They're cute, but they're aggressive. And they occur in the same areas as the endangered bighorn sheep. When there's a little watering hole, guess who takes control of the watering hole? The kind and benevolent bighorn sheep or the burrows? the burrows, and they'll actually exclude the bighorn sheep. Bighorn sheep will die in sight of water because they can't get to the hole. So we have those out there, and we think, well, they're part of our heritage. Yeah, they are, but they're not part of the ecosystem, and they're a huge problem. Take a look here at Great Lakes Introduced Species. I currently serve as the, the uh, Michigan chairperson for the Sierra Club for Aquatic Invasive Species for the Great Lakes. And we're the only state that even has such a role. The other six states and provinces do not. There are currently 190, 190 invasive aquatic species in the Great Lakes. And this is just some of them here, plants, animals, et cetera. They get here primarily in the ballast water of ocean-going ships where they get introduced, as well as some other mechanisms. Take a look at these. You recognize these guys? Purple loosestrife introduces a garden plant. Beautiful plants. Oh, part of our Michigan heritage. No, an invasive species that nothing eats. So it's gorgeous in the spring, but none of our native species will consume it, and it excludes our other plants. Same thing with a couple species of the lily pads we have in Eurasian milfoil, completely changing the aquatic ecosystem of Michigan. Okay, And then these guys, coming soon to a Great Lakes near you. Asian carp, we've heard about it, unless you haven't been conscious on the planet. Coming soon. Four species escaped into the Mississippi drainage as a result of hurricanes. They've made it up the Mississippi drainage, and they're already knocking at Lake Michigan door. The two species we're concerned about, this guy right here, the grass carp, is already in and reproducing in Lake Erie. The good news is we can literally live with the grass carp. These two guys, the big head carp, and this guy, the silver carp, very aggressive plankton eaters. They eat more plankton. Look at the size of that mouth. All they have to do is smile and swim forward, okay? And they scrub out all the plankton. They grow so fast, they can get to be over 150 pounds. Nothing feeds upon them unless they're tiny. And they get large really fast. So there's a very short period where native predators can actually feed upon them. And so we've seen the extinction of four species of fish in the upper Mississippi drainage because of starvation, because these guys are so good at scrubbing it out. And it's the silver carp right here that does this little jumping thing, and they're coming to Lake Michigan. You have a people are working on it. No, 
I'm involved in that group, okay? You have the industry lobby. You have the shipping industry. It's not gonna happen. They're coming to Lake Michigan. The fishing industry, last year, according to the Department of Interior, excuse me, the, um, who did it? Which uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that the fishing industry to the Great Lakes is $1.6 billion a year. One, that's more than I make a year. $1.6 billion a year. Imagine if we lose that, and we will lose it when the Asian carp gets here, coming soon to a lake near you. Okay, genetic assimilation. This is another reason this species can disappear? Yeah. I call this the wildlife bar at closing time, okay? So when you go out, you may decide, well, I'd like to meet somebody like this in this range. As the night drags on, you go, well, I'm willing to meet anybody in this range. I'm willing to, as you get closer to closing time, you go, anything with a heartbeat will work for me, okay? This happens in wildlife. As species numbers decrease, you go what's available. Because of the phenomenal decrease in wolf populations in the United States of all three species of our wolves, the populations are so low, and it's breeding time, which is once per year, you're looking around going, got to find a wolf, have to have a wolf, gone to find it. And then you recognize it's the end of breeding season. You go, where, oh, where have all the wolves gone? And then a good-looking coyote comes by. You go, it's 10 to 2 at the wildlife bar. That'll do. And then you go behind the bush and you make nice, nice. You smoke little candid cigarettes and you come out and you say, well, they can't reproduce with each other. Yeah, they can. What do you get? Wolf odies. Okay? Wolf odies. <laughs> this species of wolf up here is called the red wolf. We believe that the no pure genetic strains of the red wolves exist anywhere in the United States. They come from Texas, Louisiana, still found in North Carolina. But in doing the genome work on them, they're polluted with coyote blood. In fact, all wolves, in the, all wolves in the United States, every population studied has coyote genes in it because of genetic assimilation. There aren't enough other wolves when it comes time for breeding season, so you do what you can. That's the case for the turtles here in Michigan. Okay, we have one species of turtle here in Michigan, the eastern box turtle, it's common. But when you look at these, you know, look at all the difference in shell color. That's because we see hybridization now. It's closing time at the turtle bar. When it's time to reproduce and there are no members of your species, you go with whatever's close. So we see hybrids between ornate box turtles, eastern box turtles, and we're getting these hybrids, which may in fact be dead ends. And, if you, and we see the same thing with, you know what a growler is? Not the beer growler. A growler is half grizzly bear and half polar bear. We're now seeing them produced in the north. We don't know if they're sterile hybrids or what, but it's the bear bar at closing time. You breed with what you can. Low gene pool diversity. What happens when populations get so low that we now have genetic diversity so low, low in the gene pool that if the environment changes and you have no members of your population that are adapted to the change in the environment, too bad, so sad, sayonara, you go extinct, don't you? Take a look over here at the cheetah. The cheetah used to occur all the way into, south, uh, into uh, Southwest Asia, and now it's just found below Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's in relic populations where the populations are so small, they're so related to each other, at the genetic level we call them sibling species. It's as if they're all brothers and sisters. Imagine you are all part of one population of cheetahs. And because you're so closely related, a disease comes into the population. If you're susceptible to it, so are you most likely, you most likely, and you. And what happens to your whole population? Boom, disappears. This is what happened in part up at Isle Royal. Here's Isle Royal, a little bit of good news. Two years ago, we were down to three wolves at Isle Royal. And it turned out that they were all closely related. And in fact, one of them was the daughter of the male. And th there was no genetic diversity. And so what's been happening over the last 25 years at IRO, the wolf population has just been crashing because of inbreeding, low genetic diversity. Good news is they're reintroducing them this year. Already, I think, about a dozen on the island. And the target is 25 by spring. And they're not just coming from the UP. They're coming from the cheese state, Wisconsin. They're coming from Minnesota. They're selecting them from across wolf range to try and do what to genetic diversity? Increase genetic diversity. You go, why would you want to be a wolf on eye roll? Because it's moose shoulder to moose shoulder up there. It's going to be a good winter for the fools that are up there because it's moose city right now. We look here at the key deer. This is a completely different species found in the Florida Keys and nowhere else. Because of development of the Florida Keys, very few of these left. 
And so now we have no more populations to select for. We think they might have gone below what's called minimum sustainable yield. Maybe the genetic diversity is too low to do anything about it. It's just a spiral genetically possibly at this point. We see the same thing with grizzly bears. We have one population left of grizzly bears in the United States, in the continental, the four lower 48 states. This mountain lion right here is actually the Florida panther. Lives where this guy lives. Critically endangered, gene genetic diversity probably too low to maintain a viable population anymore. Biocide use. You say pesticide. That's the old term. Pesticide, aside means to kill. Pesticide infers that it only kills what? Pests, right? We know that anything that's toxic to any organism is most likely toxic to any organism at some level. So now we appropriately call it biocides. And so we look at the use that we're familiar with, for instance, of Roundup. We know the issues with you know, spraying Roundup out there. But we have a lot of novel biocides that are out there now causing all kinds of problems. We see in Michigan, if you're pregnant, plan to becoming pregnant or breastfeeding, do you have any business eating any fish from Michigan? Absolutely not. That little fishing manual you get when you get your license at Myers gives you fish consumption advisories by river in Michigan. And because of the biocide buildup and the fat, the fatty fishes, all the salmon are good for you for omega-3 fats, but omega-3 fats are also sinks for environmental contaminants, especially heavy metals. So you should eat none of the fatty fishes if you plan on reproducing. Good news, huh? Okay. The osprey, you know, and the bald eagle critically endangered at one point because of a, a, a chemical called DDT that used to be in the ecosystem. We banned it, my God, way back in the 80s, but we continued to ship it all over the world where it turns out either the prey of the bald eagle winters or the fish that migrate, and that's how our elephant seals. Elephant seals still have DDT in them. Why? Because the fish they feed upon migrate from Central America where DDT is still used. So you can't ban it in your country and ship it around the world and expect not to come home to her, not um, come home to roost. Take a look at this dead bees. These are my dead bees. Um, I used to raise bees till last year. I think up thrown in the towel because we're pretty far north as far as bee raising goes. But the issue we have right now is a whole new group of biocides called neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids are actually a derivative of nicotine. And it turns out they are really, really good at killing unwanted plants. They also kill unwanted insects. But it turns out that bees actually prefer the pollen of plants that have been sprayed with the neonicotinoids. And it causes failure of a variety of systems in the bee, and they die. I've lost every one of my hives for the last four years. I'm just giving up, OK? And uh, this is a huge issue. This is the canary in the coal mine. Because if the bees are dying, what's happening to the rest of the food chain? Okay, how about overharvest? You go, do we actually overharvest foods? Overharvest any any wildlife or plants? Anybody who says no wildlife species on this planet has ever been extinguished because of hunting, be it commercial or private, those are people who have just never studied history. The record is full of species that have disappeared because of overharvest. That can be overharvest for consumption, right? We're going to eat it, or some non-consumptive non means like trophy hunting, wildlife products, incidental take or bycatch. You're trying to get this species, but instead you get this species, or just the curio trade. And you say, well, is this still a, a, an issue? Oh, it's a huge issue. This animal over here, the great egret, critically endangered through the 1920s, 30s, and 40s because we harvest them for what reason? Feathers. Hats were a thing back in the day, remember? And the big white plumes that came off came from these birds. The carcass was tossed, you know, and just the feathers were used. Luckily, they're back now with a vengeance. Okay, tuna. Most world tuna populations are in danger or threat at this point. But you can still buy tuna. Yeah, you can. But would you buy a panda burger if you could? Now that you know, is that something that you're going to do? Okay, same thing with marlin. The billfish over here, billfish have a big Bill, right? These are marlin, sailfish, swordfish. Do not eat it. You go, but it's on the menu. It's in the menu in restaurants that aren't environmentally conscious. Five-star restaurants don't serve it anymore because it's like serving panda burgers, okay? They're an endangered species. They're available on the international market. We still have an outlaw in the United States, but most five-star restaurants won't touch it anymore because there just aren't many out there anymore. Same thing here we see with, okay, what about the bison? The plains buffalo? actually appropriately called the plains bison, you go, well, what happened to them? 
you understand that there was an intentional eradication program by the US government to get rid of the bison to try and get rid of the Plains Indians, which relied upon what? The bison herds for everything. It was intentional ratification, and it worked, unfortunately, for the Native Americans and, unfortunately, for the bison. Rhinos, we know that rhinos are harvested for what? Their horn, aphrodisiac. Uh, rhinos are now extinguished from over a dozen countries they used to occur in in Africa, and the few countries where they still remain, they're captured, and what do we do with the horn? It's cut off, okay, at great expense in doing that. Um, this guy right here, okay, this is, this is um, you may remember him, this is Lonesome George. He died four or five years ago. He was the last of his species. For over 50 years, he lived at the Darwin Research Station. We kept hoping that somewhere we'd find a mate for him. He's gone, okay, he died. Now, it's not biologically extinct because it hasn't been 50 years, but we know there are no more left on the planet. Gone, because why? Sailors ate these things into extinction. Look at this, the most abundant bird in the world. It used to occur here in Michigan, passenger pigeon. Occurred in flocks so numerous that early settlers would say that a single flock of passenger pigeons would fly overhead from horizon to horizon for hours on end. And these are from credible and army officers, okay, and many, many reports of this. And so they're now gone. How come? Because they ate our crops, okay? So we got rid of them for that reason, but that's why we got rid of the Carolina parakeet. These primarily because of market hunting. They were very easy to capture because they all roost together at night. So you just go in and you shotgun them or you burn them at night, you can get the entire flock. Now biologically extinct. The last one died in 1918 in the Cincinnati Zoo, a very lonely animal, gone. Here might be some good news. We're bringing them back, okay? Coming soon to a planet near you, passenger pigeons. The two species we're bringing back are the mammoth and the passenger pigeon. The question is, if we bring it back, I'll spare you the biology right now, where are you going to put them? Can they live in an environment that they haven't occupied for a century? Is that environment still there? So if we bring them back, will there be novelties at zoos? Or can we actually introduce them into the wild? Question is, how would they know how to be passenger pigeons? Because they're bird brains. Almost all birds have what's called innate behavior, hardwired versus learned. And there are, there are species of birds like we have in Michigan called the brown-headed cowbird. They don't even raise their own young. They lay their eggs in the nest of other birds. And when they hatch out, they're raised by this other species, but they never have an identity crisis. They immediately go and stay, learn to live with the other brown-headed cowbirds. So passenger pigeons probably will have that same instinct. You know, uh, they probably don't have to be taught if all goes well, okay? And then we look at so many of these species we see here. How about this? That's teak. It's a critically endangered hardwood. I'm a sailor. My son just bought his first sailboat, old boat, 25 years old still has teak on it. I said, look at that, but never replace this. Because you go, well, what if I could buy teak? Don't. Would you buy panda burgers, OK? Teak, critically endangered hardwood. My groups that I take to Africa, I say, we're going to see ebony wood products. Please don't buy ebony wood products. They're illegal to harvest in Kenya. Yeah, they're everywhere. They're harvested illegally. You, but I only want one little curio. You contribute to that market when you do that, OK? So, be it plant, be it animal, be aware that overconsumption is a huge issue. Especially when it comes to curios, we all love seashells, right? Ever gone to, what, where, where is Disney World? K Kissimmee, is that how you pronounce it? Kissimmee, Kissimmee, Florida. When you go there on the main drag, there is just store after store after store of shell shops, right? Two, three stories tall. You go, oh, somebody's out on the beach harvesting these once they've died a natural long life and washed up on the beach, no because they immediately begin to degrade in the chemistry of the ocean. These are all harvested alive, okay? I used to work in a place in, in a bay in Mexico where the shell, the, the, the shell collectors came in and in one year harvested all these little shells called a pink murex, I don't have them up here, and completely decimated them in one summer, took almost 100% of them out. An important base of the food chain, we saw huge ecological consequences as a result of that, okay? How about overconsumption once again? This guy right here, this is an elephant bird, so-called, because look at that egg, that's impressive. This, this animal disappeared probably between um, 1200 AD and 1500 AD, got to be 1100 pounds. Imagine the drumstick that sailors got out of that. 
and that's why these were slaughtered, right? They came from Madagascar, okay, southeast coast of, of uh, Africa, okay? These guys right here in the top left, moas from New Zealand, survived until the mid-1700s, okay? And they were fed upon by the Maori natives in that area, and, but they're not the guys that, of course, extinguished them. It was Europeans who came in and said, whoa, we can feed a lot of people by harvesting these. Once the Europeans started to harvest them, they were gone in about 17 years. Biologically extinct, don't occur anymore. How about this guy over here? The Irish elk. If you tour castles in, in England, you will see some of these up above the doors there, just the antlers. When it also went extinct in the 1700s because that's a whole tasty meal there. Biologically extinct because of over-harvesting. Okay. How about restricted habitat? Can you have restricted habitat that causes problems for them? Absolutely. The poor panda, how many times have we seen this guy? We're going to see him a couple more times, which is why they're critically endangered, because so many factors are influencing their population. Take a look at where they used to live. Here's the historical range. Here's where they occur today in remnant populations. And their numbers are less than 1,000 in the wild right now. And how come? Well, it's what they feed upon. As we'll see yet in another slide, they feed upon bamboo. Now, there are over 700 species of bamboo. They feed on four species. You know, why don't they learn to eat something else? Take it up with the pandas, OK? In the wild, in the captivity, my god, they'll eat cantaloupe. They'll eat watermelon. They'll eat anything. But in the wild, they go, wrong species of bamboo, and that bamboo only occurs in very, very restricted habitats. The reason they're no longer here is because primarily of habitat destruction. This is very farmable, arable land, so a lot of the forest has been removed for that purpose. So the poor pandas are getting hit right and left. Okay? Take a look at a Michigan example. This is our Kirtland's Warbler. Kirtland's Warbler, Kirtland's College up north, community college, named after this little guy right here, uh, possibly the most endangered bird in the world. Uh, every single one of them, as far as we know, has a band on it because there's so few left. Probably uh, maybe a hundred or so that might be left, maybe as much as a couple hundred. Where do they occur? There. Okay. So when you get up by Higgins Lake, there's a, there's a Kirtland's Warbler Preserve up there. And this is where they spend all of summer. And you say, well, why are they endangered? Well, restricted habitat. We have three species of pine trees in Michigan, red pine, white pine, and this guy called the jack pine. They only reproduce under jack pines. No other species of pines in the world, just jack pines, okay? And not all jack pines, just small jack pines, because this is not a very smart bird. It's the only warbler on the planet that nests on the ground. They had the instructions upside down when they were looking for nesting building, okay? They nest on the ground, not in the tree. Is this a good idea when you're at the bottom of the food chain? Yeah, okay, not a good idea. But what they do is they, they nest on the ground, as you can see, you know, one of them right here. Here's the jack pine. Look at the branch right here. As long as we have tiny jack pines, at least they can nest underneath the branches. But Smokey the Bear did such a great job of keeping forest fires out of Michigan for half a century that what happened to all the small jack pines? They turned into big jack pines and no regeneration. So there was no one for them to nest. Now that we've figured this out, we slice and dice the forest. We regenerate it for them, but the populations have plummeted. So why aren't they doing well? Because that's where they spend about seven months of the year. Then they fly down here to the Bahamas. Smart bird, winter in the Bahamas, okay? Problem is, they're not protected in the Bahamas, and the Bahamas have almost no native vegetation for them to spend the rest of the year. So they basically functionally starve to death in the Bahamas. Not good for us to preserve and not the Bohemians. So it's a problem with international conservation. So they have such a restricted habit. You go, why don't those dumb birds just go here or here or here or here? Again, because the behavior is innate, right? It's not a learned behavior. It's innate. They're hardwired to do it. They really have no choice, OK? Restricted diet. Oh, geez, OK. Here we go again. The panda. I already told you. This guy feeds on three to four species of bamboo in the wild. Why can't we train them to live on something else? Again, they're hardwired for this in the wild. In captivity, we can get them to eat pretty much anything that we give them, but not in the wild. So they're facing extreme consequences as a result of the habitat constriction, that restricted habitat, and a very, very narrow diet. And how about these guys up here? Koalas from Australia. What's their issue? Eucalyptus, 835 species of eucalyptus on the planet. More species of eucalyptus than any other plant 
on the planet. One genus, 835 species. You go, sweet, they're sitting pretty. The 13 species. And they occur in Queensland, Australia, where the eucalyptus are being removed by the government, the eucalyptus forest, to make it safe for cattle. So they're not doing well because you go, why don't they eat something else? Take it up with the koala union, okay? They're hardwired and also they have a really unique physiology because eucalyptus hardly anything eats because of all these things called plant poisons, phytotoxins that are in them. Koalas are able to metabolize them. They've co-evolved together. They have a very narrow range they can feed upon. Take a look at this guy. Whoa, let's go back one here. This guy right here. Uh, whoa, back one more, sorry. Okay, if we take a look at this guy right here, this is called the Everglade kite. We've already seen the, what, Everglade Florida panther endangered. We've already seen the Everglade key deer endangered. Why? Because we're draining the keys, right? We're draining the Everglades for development. And so what's happened to this guy? Well, this animal here feeds upon one thing and one thing only. It feeds upon that snail. It's called a bubble snail, okay? Bubble snails float at the surface in a little bubble of mucus that they make, okay? Can't swim, make a mucus raft. Live on the mucus raft. Well, that's a bit of a bummer because when you're at the surface, yeah, all the fish don't get you down there usually, but this predator has co-evolved to feed upon one thing and one thing only, bubble snails. And in fact, look at the beak. Does that not say escargot fork? Okay, no other raptor has a big beak like that. Look at the talons. That says snail plucker, okay? It plucks, they actually hover just like this. Well, that's why they're called kites. They hover, they come down, they delicately lift up the snail, fly away, and in one swoop, the beak goes in there, pulls out the snail, and they go after another. They go, why don't they take fish? It's not part of their innate behavior, right? They can't do that. So as we drain the wetlands in Florida, what happens to every day kite? disappears. There are about 45 left in the wild right now. Okay. Who else do we have for you here? <coughs> Food chain imbalance. Is it possible that we may even have native species or species who weren't intentionally introduced, but they're out of proportion? Yeah. Take a look at these little guys. How cute. On a cuddle scale of 1 to 10, is that not a 12? Okay. I mean, these are really cute animals. Oh, I love raccoons. Okay. We have here in West Michigan, we have a higher concentration raccoons per square mile in where? Metropolitan Grand Rapids or the country? Metropolitan Grand Rapids. Okay. They do better in the city than they do in the country, which is the case for raccoons, rats, and cockroaches, right? When the rest of the world's gone, we'll have raccoons, cockroaches, and rats, and coyotes, right? They'll be here. So they do very well, but the problem is they reproduce, well, like raccoons, okay? And as a result, they're voracious omnivores. What do they eat? Everything. Part of the reason our turtle populations are crashing, guess what they do? Dig up turtle eggs. Guess what they do to the hatchlings? Eat them. Guess what they do to ground nesting birds? Eat them. What do they eat? Everything. And so we have too many raccoons as a result of lack of predators that prey upon them. That's the case with this guy right here. Now, once again, cute, 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 cute. I was having a conversation with some of the audience that I'm going to say, we have the cutest possum on our deck. Don't feed them. Okay? You go, but they're natives. Well, see footnote. They're native all the way up to Virginia. What's happened now? We keep increasing the quality of their habitat, and as the climate gets warmer, they can winter here. You notice they have a naked tail? Try being naked this winter and see what happens to your tail, okay? It'll freeze, it'll crack, it'll break up. Look at this, naked ears. So they couldn't survive in Michigan until about 25 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. They're increasing the range naturally because of climate change, but that's causing chaos because they have the same diet the raccoons do. They'll eat anything. And that's causing a decrease in reptiles, a decrease in amphibians, a decrease in nesting birds, and the whole food chain has been disrupted. And then here's some vermin over here, European starling. Have you seen these massive flocks over the bridge right over here on the freeway, right across from the post office? Watch this summer at dusk. You'll see flocks of several hundred thousand of these birds, and they roost underneath the 96 bridge there. Back in the late 1800s, somebody in New York City thought it would be really cool to have every animal ever mentioned in a Shakespeare play in New York City Central Park. And so this person, using his own wealth, imported every animal ever mentioned in a Shakespeare play into New York City Central Park. The good news is winter happened the first year, and almost every one of them died the first year. 
except for the European starling, now found in every single one of the 48 states and a major problem in agricultural crops as well as airports. These are the guys that get sucked into the jet engines as planes take off. And so they actually are cavity nesters. They compete with our native cavity nesting species like the wrens, like the woodpeckers, like the bluebirds. They kick them out and take over their nests. Where starlings come, cavity nesting birds plummet. And that's the case here in Michigan. Okay, natural extinctions. It happens, right? Okay, ask your local T-Rex. Okay, sometimes stuff happens, right? We know that about 65 million-ish years ago, there was a big old meteor that hit right off the Yucatan Peninsula. What today is uh, Merida, right north of Cancun, is where this thing went kerplunk. And of course, we wiped out most of the reptiles on the planet. At the time, mammals were still around, but the big dinosaurs went bye-bye. That's a natural event. Very famous fossil from Michigan, trilobites, no longer with us. They're naturally extinct. If you believe paleontologists, 95 to 99% of all species that have ever occurred on this planet are now naturally, naturally extinct. And that's OK. Because then why are we worried about all this stuff? Why are we talking about this? Because we've seen more species go extinct since the Industrial Revolution than the previous 300 million times of evolutionary history. It's this accelerated extinction that's the concern. It's not natural. Okay? This is natural. Okay, accelerated extinction is not. Habitat destruction. Why is it in red? This is the most important. Habitat destruction. I have a lot of students that I'm lucky enough to have who say, you know, you, you've, 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 you've lit this, this, this flame inside of me. I want to do something to make the world better. I say, great. Do you have any idea what that is? I go, yes. I want to breed endangered species and release them into the wild. Is the where? The wild. Where is that? I've been lucky enough to travel to pretty much every continent on, in the planet right now, and, and I'm almost afraid to go back and look at places I visited 20, 30, 40 years ago because that wild just doesn't exist. If you go to South Africa, do you have visions of giraffes and zebra and wildebeest? They're there, but only in national parks. It's like having to go to Yosemite to see a bear because they occur nowhere else in California. Okay? That's not the case in California. But that's what we're looking at is habitat destruction. Because look at the pressures that we have on habitats. You folks that are driving, I've been in Grand Rapids since 1993 in West Michigan, and I see the change that's happened in West Michigan just in the time I've been here. And so with a population increasing as it is on the planet, it's no surprise. Right? When I started teaching as a 24-year-old teaching ecology, there were 3.5 billion people on the planet. 3.5 billion. How many do we have right now? 7.3. The population of the world has doubled in just the time I've been teaching. It will double two times during your lifetime because it's, an exp it's a logarithmic rate, isn't it? So think about that, okay? So on half the time, you'll see the population double. Have you folks been to Woodland Mall at Christmas? Okay. I mean, have you traveled to developing country? Have you been to Mexico City? Have you been to Thailand? Have you been to Singapore? Have you been to Bangladesh? Have you been to Delhi? See what your future holds and say, why is the habitat disappearing? Because our population is increasing so incredibly rapidly. And it's habitat destruction that we need to deal with. And, and we're just about done here. I just want to point out from the areas of the greatest concern right now, take a look here in Madagascar, okay? The murres. these are primates. That's your Uncle Fred right there. These are the most primitive primates on the planet. They'll be gone within probably a decade in the wild in Madagascar. Madagascar is being clear cut, then it's being strip mined from one end to the other. It's far more unique than the Galapagos Islands. It will be gone probably within about 10 years. Over here, New Guinea. New Guinea is also, this is New Guinea, it's being clear cut and it's being strip mined from one end to the other. Most of nature in New Guinea will be gone within the next 20 years. Okay. Take a look at the Amazon, okay? What are we doing? We're burning the Amazon to make it safe, in most cases, for palm trees. Why? For palm oil. How many products have palm oil that you purchase? Most of them. Start reading labels. Don't do that. Last week, we have a new president that was elected in Brazil. You say, why do I care about domestic politics in Brazil? 
because the current law in Brazil is that if you're a landowner, 80% of your land must remain in natural forest vegetation. You can clear the other 20. He's going to remove that law. If he removes that law, that means they're no longer in compliance with their carbon ratio with the Paris Climate Accord. Because when you have 80% of your country as functioning lungs, it scrubs out the carbon from your dirty industries. They said you'll be in violation of the Paris Peace Accord. We'll be the second nation to drop out of the Paris Peace Accord. That's why you care about domestic politics in Brazil. So what have we talked about? Look at this. We talked about 17, because Tim said I couldn't talk for three days. We just briefly had a meet and greet with 17 different reasons that organisms are becoming endangered, threatened, or extinguished on our planet. And now you can understand these outrageous numbers I gave you as we started. So you say, OK, man, thank you. I'm supposed to end with a happy note. Every time you watch the doom and gloom, fin fur and feather flicks on TV, this has always been my pet peeve, they just you know, punch you in the gut over and over again. The last five minutes, they go, but it's OK, because scientists are working on you. You can go about your day and not worry about it. That's not reality. That's not what's happening. So what is the greatest threat to our natural resources and our planet? Lack of interest, lack of enthusiasm, lack of concern. Indifference, unconcern, torpor, listlessness. What have you done for the environment this year? What organizations do you belong to? Do you vote with an eye to the environment? Do you know in this country who's head of your interior department? Do you know who's head of your EPA? Do you know who's the head of your US Department of Agriculture? Do you know who's in head of all of your resource agencies? Are they working in your best interest? If you think yes, great. If you think no, then do something about it. What about all the other countries? Do you join any national organizations, international, World Wildlife Fund? Don't buy a pizza this week. Send that money to an organization that work on your behalf. You don't have to do the work yourself. Plenty of people will be happy to work for you, but they need resources to do it. Einstein said, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil but by those that watch them without doing anything. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Forbes. We have time for some questions, if anybody has any questions. Oh, wait, hold on one second so the audio can grab you. Um, when you were going over the food uh, chain imbalance, mm -hmm. you had the, the, the deer up there. Yeah. Um, I live in a pretty rural part of this. Yeah. Um, and I hate to admit this, but my mother-in-law feeds the deer. Yeah. Um, you didn't talk about that. Can you the tell me so I can tell her? Sure. Do you want the mother-in-law friendly version sure. or the reality sure. version? Oh, okay, let's do the reality version. Uh, when I, every, every country I live in in the world, I love reading the journals of the explorers who went, first went through the area to get a feel. I did the same when I moved to Michigan in 93. I read all of the uh, French journals, you know, written in French, which translated because I don't speak French. But it was interesting. They talked about, about um, there was malaria back then in Michigan. You understand that malaria is a native disease to North America, including Michigan. So they talked about the malaria, because most of Michigan was wetlands. They talked about trudging, because we've drained most of Michigan to make it safe for corn. So they talked about dredging through the mosquito-infested swamps and the lack of food. They came close to starvation, because when you have a closed canopy forest, you have no sunlight striking the bottom. When you have no sunlight, you have no shrubbery. When you have no shrubbery, you have no vegetation. When you have no vegetation, you have no food for deer. So there was very little game. But then Europeans come here and we open up the forest. The sunlight comes through, there's plenty of vegetation. What happens to deer populations? Boom. Conservative estimates put the current deer population in Michigan at maybe 10 to 20 times what it is pre-European. We have more deer than we possibly can handle in Michigan, which is why it's essential. And people, I'm a tree hugger. People go, you're an advocate for deer hunting? I used to work for the Department of Fish and Game in California. I ran the deer hunts. I did the statistics. I'm not a hunter myself. I love them. They're so cute. I'd rather hug them than shoot them and eat them. But the reality is we don't have the food chain balance we need. So we need a method of getting it. I haven't told my wife yet. I hope she's not listening. I was telling someone in the hallway, a neighbor last night called and said, 
uh, we just shot a deer and it's on your property. Can we come and look for it? And I said, well, yeah. I mean, I think, oh, God, it's probably the deer that I enjoy in my backyard all the time. But then again, if the deer get too high in numbers, we're going to lose the rest of the ecosystem. So feeding deer is a bad idea as much as we want to see them. Also, should you feed them corn? Okay. Cor 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 corn is terrible for deer unless they're living on it all year long. They can't digest it. So when winter comes and people throw corn out there, that first batch of corn can cause the death of the deer because they can't break it down and it starts to ferment and they actually die from that. And DNR just had a report in there showing that most of the deer they find in the necrosomy, stomach full of corn. So tell her, you're killing deer. Bambi is exploding because of your activity. She'll hug you. This will come out well. <laughs> is there another question? Any other questions? Right up here in the front we have two. So with zoos, since we're running out of the wild, um, naturally, when we're trying to conserve species, where's the line between poaching species to put in zoos versus taking species to conserve them for hopefully like future wild if we get our act together? What do you mean poaching species? Like taking them from the wild to, to try put in zoos. Oh, okay. Um, to where they say they're trying to conserve, but they're also taking them from the wild, so which end of the spectrum really is it? You, any, any zoo in the United States that's a member of the American Zoological Association of Zoos and Aquaria are all regulated. They're part of the scientific program. It's when you go to Billy Bob Jorway and John Boy's Petting Zoo, you know, and the whatever, that's the issue right there. But anybody who's a member of the American Zoological and Aquaria Association are all vetted, and in fact, there's a very robust breeding program. For instance, red wolves right now, um, no zoo will touch red wolves. Uh, there are very few zoos that have red wolves because they don't want to display them because they don't believe they're purebreds, which apparently they're not now, so nobody's going to touch them. So, and there's no work being done in the wild, so we actually need some zoos to say, could you please take these red wolves and maybe we can you know, kind of breed away the wolf genes and get the pure red wolf back. So there's a huge value in captive breeding because remember I gave you the multiple species that no longer occur in the wild? Like the Hawaiian crow, if it wasn't for zoos, we'd have zero Hawaiian crows. So when regulated, and it's very well regulated with major zoos, it's a good thing to do. There was a question. Right. Question? Right, right here in the front, I think oh. you had one right here, this lady. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned Madagascar, and yeah. I wasn't aware of anything there. Can you? Mad yeah, Madagascar off the uh, you know, southeast coast of Africa is one of the biological gems on the planet botanically and zoologically. There are trees there that are just off of lunar landscape. They're spectacular. There are tortoises like in the Galapagos, not as large there. There are lemurs, the only place on the planet where they occur. But when's the last time you heard of the Madagascar economy being a big player in the world economy? They don't make anything. They have no economy. So like with New Guinea, their own, own economy, like the Middle East countries, is to harvest their natural resources until they no longer can. And so when you're, for instance, like Saudi Arabia, what does Saudi Arabia do besides oil? There isn't much of another economy there. When they run out of oil, there's going to be an issue. Luckily, you know, in the case of uh, Saudi Arabia, they're not destroying a whole bunch of habitat up on top and not doing that. But in New Guinea and in Madagascar, the clear cutting has been done, and now foreign mining companies have come in, and they're, they're just strip mining it. And you say, okay, that's short-sighted. We do that. We make those decisions all the time, don't we? We always make those decisions because especially, you know, when politicians, their actual tenure is very short compared to the longevity of the planet. So you want to get elected next time, so you make the decisions that put food in people's mouths. And I have to also say that we have to understand that if any of us were starving, if our family is starving, would you care about taking that turtles that came up on the beach to lay its eggs? Of course you wouldn't. You're probably lying if you said you wouldn't. You'd feed your family. So what we need to do is find a mechanism by which those families aren't put in that situation anymore. Mm, I didn't realize there was that much population there. I guess it's a population thing. Oh, it's not a very populous country. It's just the fact that it's a developing world. You it's know, enough, things don't, yeah. things don't work very well and above board. All right. Well, I want to respect everybody's time. I'm sure Dr. Forbes would be happy to discuss any questions you have afterwards. So thanks Absolutely. for coming. Thank you for coming, folks. And yep. hope you'll come to our next one also. Thank you very much.